and you are looking live at a Falcon 9 rocket on the launch pad at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. At 12.51 this afternoon, the aerospace company SpaceX will launch a Dragon cargo spacecraft on a NASA mission to resupply the International Space Station. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to NASA's Kennedy Space Center for our live coverage of the launch of the 19th resupply mission for SpaceX. I'm your host, Jennifer Wolfinger. We are about 20, 28 minutes away from the planned liftoff of a Falcon 9 rocket from the coast of Florida. The mission? To fly much-needed astronaut supplies and research experiments up to the International Space Station. And we have a team of correspondents across the country helping us cover all the angles of this launch. We will head to the Mission Director Center here on the Space Coast to get updates on the weather and the countdown. And we'll head west to SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, and check in at Mission Control Houston at Johnson Space Center. But first, here are some quick facts about today's launch. SpaceX transported the Falcon 9 rocket out to the launch pad and lifted it to the vertical launch position for the 19th cargo resupply mission to the International Space Station. This is the third flight for this Dragon spacecraft and the first time this Falcon booster has been flown. Dragon will deliver more than 5,700 pounds of astronaut supplies and payloads for science research to the orbiting laboratory. The launch window today is instantaneous, which means SpaceX must launch at the exact second for the planned liftoff or try again another day. The plan is to keep the Dragon spacecraft docked to station for about a month before bringing it back to Earth. The Dragon spacecraft will be filled with critical materials to directly support science and research that will take place on the International Space Station. Dragon will carry the confined combustion investigation, which examines the behavior of flame as it spreads in differently shaped confined spaces and microgravity. Understanding how fire spreads and behaves in space is crucial for the safety of astronauts and for understanding and controlling fire here on Earth. Another exciting payload is the Hyperspectral Imager Suite, which is a next generation hyperspectral Earth imaging system developed by the Japanese government. It provides space-based observations for tasks such as resource exploration and applications in agriculture, forestry, and other environmental areas. The Mighty Mice in Space, or Rodent Research 19 investigation, will research features that influence muscle degradation to prevent skeletal muscle and bone loss during spaceflight and enhance recovery following return to Earth. This study could also support the development of therapies for a wide range of conditions that cause muscle and bone loss. Later in the show, we'll be joined by a station national lab expert who will share more details about the exciting research taking place on station. Now let's bring in NASA's Joshua Santora, who is in the Mission Director Center just a few miles away from the launch pad. Hey, Joshua. Hey, Jennifer. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas here on the Space Coast, and for us that means partly cloudy skies and cool mornings and days. So the weather outside is looking great. That is a big point of concern yesterday. Um, at what would have been T minus zero at liftoff time, we did have winds that would have violated the launch constraints. So um, we're back here today. The weather's looking great. We have uh, actually, we've just got a recent update that the percent of violation is actually now down to 10%. So the weather even improving for today. We've got nice skies out there. Um, those, there are some clouds that are coming through the general area, um, but ultimately we're hearing that those are not going to arrive until after our launch today. So weather looks great. That coming care of our launch weather officer, Mike uh, <coughs> McAleenan um, from the U.S. Air Force 45th Space Wing Weather Squadron. So we're keeping an eye on the technical side as well, and it has been a really quiet morning for the countdown, which is good news. That means there are not a lot of issues, um, hardly any to speak of, in fact. Um, so keep an eye on things progressing well. Again, our instantaneous window is actually set for 12, 29, and 24 seconds. So that's the instant that we're looking to, to launch today. Um, and this rocket actually is carrying the star of the show, the, the Cargo Dragon, with those resources and research and supplies. Uh, this Cargo Dragon was originally flown back in September of 2014 on the Commercial Resupply Services 4 mission. Uh, you can see here a beautiful night launch lighting up the sky and delivering research and, and cargo back in 2014. And then uh, actually the first Cargo Dragon to be reused in June of 2017, it flew again on the CRS-11 mission. That's actually from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center. So. Uh, a very exciting accomplishment for them, and this another exciting accomplishment today with this Cargo Dragon flying for its third time. This is the first time we've had a Cirrus Cargo Dragon that is a third flown, um, which is amazing. I'm so excited to have that. Uh, another groundbreaking achievement for the CRS program um, and for just the life of the space station. So, um, Jennifer, we are underway with fueling. Um, 
things progressing well, again, targeting that instantaneous window. So for for us here, now we're going to send it back over to you, and we'll, uh, we'll touch back in a few minutes. Thanks, Joshua, and we'll check back with you a little later. Right now, we are at T-minus 24 minutes and counting. Let's check in with SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, where the Falcon 9 rocket and Crew Dragon were designed and built. Andy Tran is joining us live from SpaceX's Mission Control Center. Andy, will you tell us a little bit about Dragon's history? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jennifer. This mission marks SpaceX's 12th launch of 2019, and today we're going to be launching a flight-proven Dragon spacecraft. As Joshua mentioned, this vehicle visited the International Space Station twice before, both on CRS-11 in June of 2017 and CRS-4 back in September of 2014. And while, and while this Dragon has flown before, the booster we'll be flying today is actually brand new. After stage separation, we'll be landing the first stage on our drone trip out in the Atlantic Ocean so that it can be reflown on future missions. Now, both Falcon 9 and Dragon were designed with reflight in mind, so the vehicle hardware is built to support multiple missions with minimal refurbishment in between. Our Dragon spacecraft has been flying for nearly nine years now, and today it's one of the few vehicles flying that, that can deliver significant cargo to the International Space Station and the only one that can deliver significant cargo from it. To provide a little historical background, in 2010, SpaceX became the first private company to send a spacecraft into orbit and then return it to Earth. Just two years later, Dragon became the first privately developed spacecraft to visit the space station. Since then, SpaceX has made a total of 19 trips to the International Space Station, and we're under contract NASA for a total of 26 of these cargo resupply missions. Today's mission is to support the 20th trip to the International Space Station, and we're looking forward to a successful launch day. With that, back to you, Jennifer. Thanks, Andy. We are commemorating the 20th year of the International Space Station. October 31st, 2020 marks two decades of continuous human presence in space, and November 2nd, 2020 marks 20 years of continuous human presence in low Earth orbit. The space station, one of the most ambitious international collaborations ever attempted, is a convergence of science, technology, and human innovation. It is one of the most crucial stepping stones for NASA's plan to land humans on the moon in 2024 through the Artemis program. Liftoff of today's rocket from Launch Complex 40 is timed right down to the very second. The reason for this? SpaceX needs to get their cargo spacecraft lined up to rendezvous with the International Space Station. For more on this, let's check in with NASA's Dan Hewitt, who is live at Johnson Space Center in Houston. Dan? Hey, thanks, Jennifer, and welcome everybody inside of Mission Control Houston here at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. As you may be able to see right over my shoulder, uh, the holidays have arrived here in the control room, where right now the Orbit 2 team is on console supporting the crew on board. They are led today in the room right now by Flight Director Allison Bollinger, who just about two hours ago pulled the teams and was able to report to the SpaceX mission director that the International Space Station is go for today's launch. Dragon ultimately bound for the International Space Station, where right now the six-person crew of Expedition 61 is going through a day preparing for this eventual arrival. They are led by Luca Parmitano. He's the tall gentleman right there in the middle. He's an ESA astronaut from Italy. Going from left to right real quick, NASA astronaut Drew Morgan, Russian cosmonaut Alexander Skortsov, Parmitano, and then just next to him, uh, Oleg Skropochka, another Roscosmos cosmonaut. And then rounding out the crew on the right there are NASA astronauts Jessica Mir and Christina Cook. 
Once Dragon arrives with a launch today, it's going to arrive on Sunday, and that will be up to Luca and Drew, uh, Luca Parmentano and Drew Morgan to actually use the station's 57-foot-long robotic arm, the Canada Arm 2, to reach out and grapple the Dragon once it arrives. It'll camp out about 30 feet or so away from the International Space Station, and they'll use that arm to reach out and grab it right out of space. Then they'll turn over control down to the teams here on the ground to actually install Dragon, and we'll obviously be bringing you coverage of all that once it arrives. That'll be happening on Sunday with a launch today, capture timed right around 5 a.m. Central Time, 6 a.m. Eastern. As you saw, there's about 5,700 pounds of cargo coming up. And Jennifer walked through some of the highlights of the research. There's over one ton of science investigations on board. And with these SpaceX missions, they usually kick off a really fast and furious couple of weeks for the crew once the Dragon arrives, as there's a lot of what we call sortie science, so science coming up that has to come back down with Dragon in just 30 days once it returns. So the crew will be very busy. They've just wrapped up a bunch of spacewalks, now about to get into some really hardcore science over the next couple of weeks during this Dragon mission. But with that, we are excited, ready to see Dragon launch. Everything's go on the International Space Station side. So I'm going to send it back down to Florida. Back over to you, Jennifer. Thanks, Dan. CRS-19 is packed with a variety of investigations sponsored by the U.S. National Laboratory. Here's a closer look at that research. Joining me now is Patrick O'Neill, an expert on the U.S. National Lab. Thanks for being here, Patrick. Thank you for having me. We saw some really cool science in that video. Can you tell us a little bit more about the investigations happening on the lab? Yeah, I think that that video was a great encapsulation of some of the payloads that are going on this mission. We have everything from rodents, model organisms that are flying. Uh, Budweiser is sending more barley to the space station. This will be their fourth separate investigation to the space station. Uh, and then on top of that, we're also looking at fire in confined spaces. So I think that the video kind of touched on some of those elements. Uh, but there's also cube satellites that are flying on this mission. Uh, we also have an investigation that is sponsored by the uh, National stem cell foundation that is looking at brain organoids that is focused on Parkinson's disease as well as multiple sclerosis. So we really have uh, an awful lot of diversity that is on this mission and it really kind of encapsulates uh, what's possible on the space station. Whether you're looking at life, physical, material sciences, technology development, it's all, it's all uh, represented right here on this mission. All that sounds really amazing which may make it hard for you to answer this question. What do you consider to be some of the highlights of the year? Well, I think that this year in general has just been a banner year for the space station in its entirety, whether that be from a national lab perspective or from NASA. Speaking on behalf of the National Laboratory, this has truly been uh, you know, the, the, the banner year of research to date. We've sent more payloads to the space station than we ever have before. We've uh, had astronauts working on uh, research on the space station, station more than they ever had before. And I think that that all sets the foundation for what we're going to be seeing down the road. It really demonstrates this enhanced desire for researchers to leverage this unique orbiting laboratory. 
Right. We, we accomplished so much this year. What do you see for 2020? Well, I, I would like to say that you're going to see more of the same, but just that you're going to see more of it. You know, I think that the idea is that uh, we're going to be sending more payloads that uh, have uh, recognizable companies and brands that are interested in using the space station to enhance products, therapies, uh, to improve life on Earth. And then we're also going to be seeing uh, a variety of partners like the NIH and the NSFs of the world who are looking to fund investigations uh, that can bring fundamental and applied knowledge uh, from space-based activity and bringing it back home here on Earth. I can't think of a better way to start a new decade. Thank you again for being here with yeah, us. Thank you so much, and go Dragon. Go <laughs> Dragon. Measuring the weight of objects in a microgravity environment can be complicated. Here's a look at how astronauts measure items on station, a place where scales don't work. At home, many people can and do weigh the food they eat. It's as easy as putting it on a scale. But scales don't work without gravity. So, how do astronauts measure the weight of small items in a microgravity environment like the International Space Station? They measure mass instead. What's the difference? Mass is the measure of how much matter something contains. Weight, on the other hand, is the measurement of the pull of gravity on an object. We can actually know how much our plants are weighing that the astronauts will consume. So they use the Newton's second law of motion, which has force, mass, and acceleration. Under the same amount of force, an object with more mass will accelerate less. So, to apply this in space, astronauts use the Mass Measurement Device, MMD, which launched to the space station in 2017. They then put these plant samples inside a little Ziploc bag, and then the mass measurement device goes back and forth a few times. The MMD applies a known acceleration to the sample and measures the resulting force, allowing the system to determine its mass. It can measure between 1 and 100 grams and has an accuracy of 0.1 grams. It's, it's wonderful. It's really, really accurate. So it's, it's a great new tool that we have. There are multiple mass measurement devices on the space station. They measure everything from astronauts who are monitoring their health to freshly harvested produce from the station's veggie growth chamber. So, when microgravity makes it impossible to tip the scales, it's mass that matters most. We are now about 12 minutes away from launch. Let's head back over to the Mission Director Center to get an update from NASA's Joshua Santora. Hey, Joshua, how are things looking? Hey, Jennifer, things are looking really great. Uh, one of my favorite things is uh, rocket launches, and so we get to experience that today because we do not have a winter wonderland out there. Uh, so, again, the weather is looking really positive. Things progressing well. Um, there, uh, You see that beautiful rocket on the pad. Um, this shot, a special thanks to our drone team out there. They're flying out a UAV, taking this shot for us. So should be beautiful views all around of the launch today. Again, we're targeting that instantaneous window at 12, 29, and 24 seconds Eastern time. Um, so we're at about 11 and a half minutes and counting. So things progressing well. You see the rocket there with the gaseous oxygen venting off the side. That's completely normal and expected. That's part of using cryogenic fuel. We have liquid oxygen. And so when you're loading that, you're going to have boil off. And so ultimately, you want to vent that out of the rocket. And that's what you see there. Um, no harm there, because it's just more oxygen into the atmosphere. Today, the, the goal here is to get the Dragon into orbit to be on its way to the space station. And so I uh, want to touch on that Dragon in particular, its, its capacity. You saw some of those great stats from Dan as far as the amount of things that are going up, the, the, the weight there. Uh, but volume-wise, the Dragon can carry about 25 cubic meters of things, uh, st research, materials, supplies, resources. Um, and so it's about 11 cubic meters in the capsule itself and 14 in the trunk. The trunk there is the cylindrical portion where you see the actual Dragon logo there on the side of the rock, on the, the spacecraft, excuse me. So just for comparison's sake, um, 25 cubic meters, how, how big is that? So if you have a minivan, a six or seven passenger minivan, um, generally speaking, those typically hold about four to four and a quarter cubic meters. So if you take six of those minivans together and the storage capacity in those six minivans, that's roughly the same kind of capacity you have for the Dragon, a very, very uh, well efficiently used space um, in there to kind of pack that well. Um, even up until a couple days ago, late into Tuesday, they were actually doing their late loads. There are certain 
portions of the supplies that they want to have away from our laboratory for as little time as possible. And so there's about 700 pounds that they loaded up on Tuesday. That combined with the other 5,000 that was already on there. So you've got a little over 5,700 pounds of cargo. Um, again, spending about four weeks at station, and then it will be returning back um, to hopefully be reused at some point in the future. That Dragon is being carried by that Falcon rocket you see there. Um, it is a two-stage rocket, about 230 feet tall, 12 feet in diameter, and the nine Merlin um, engines will produce about 1.7 million pounds of thrust at liftoff. So that first stage, like we heard from Andy, is going to be, they're going to attempt to land that on their drone ship about 185 nautical miles off the coast of Jacksonville. Again, that's a secondary objective, and SpaceX is always good about declaring that, that getting Cargo Dragon to its correct orbit is primary, and the Falcon recovery is a big bonus for them. So that second stage does have its own Merlin 1D vacuum engine, and it will produce about 210,000 pounds of thrust. Um, that's obviously in a vacuum of space, um, and so we'll be looking for that performance as well. Obviously, this is a multi-stage rocket, so there's a lot of performance required to, to get us to the right orbit. A little bit. Um, we are again looking great there. You see some blue skies. You see a little bit of partly cloudy in the background, but that's quite all right. And the weather here forecast again, uh, we've updated that graphic for you. We've got some winds. Again, you kind of see the gaseous oxygen moving off the rocket. Again, that's just a result of the winds. Temperatures again, it's a it's a really nice morning here on the on the space coast. Um, the potential for clouds to be in the way is is the main thing we were looking at. But as you see, less than 10% chance that that's going to be a problem this morning. So weather looking great. Technically, we're looking great. We should start to hear some more calls coming up in the next few minutes concerning the preparedness of the rocket and the, the spacecraft. Ultimately, that's kind of what's happening in these last few minutes. SpaceX does a late fuel. They like to fuel as late as possible to allow the their cryogenics to be as cold as possible so they can pack as much in there as densely as possible so that that does allow them to be able to have more performance because if you, if you can pack more fuel in there, you have more performance opportunity. So that's great. We're playing catch up to the space station, uh, like we've been saying all all morning. Again, we're about seven and a half minutes away from liftoff, and right now the space station is flying over the Southern Pacific Ocean, headed up on a path that will take it over Central America, and then actually across the eastern portion of the United States. And we'll rendezvous again, as Dan said, Sunday morning is the plan for for berthing. So exciting stuff there. The space station again, thinking about kind of the capacity and ability. Think about the the volume of a six bedroom house. So if you're, if you have a six-bedroom home, that's roughly the amount of space that the astronauts have. They have the added benefit of being in microgravity so they can use the walls and the ceiling yeah, freely the because they don't have that, that feeling of gravity all the time. So um, maybe even feels bigger than a six-bedroom house. That's roughly 33,000 cubic feet if you're interested in the numbers. The space station program involves more than 10,000 people and space agencies and uh, 37 U.S. states and 16 countries. So a, a massive effort. Again, as we've been saying, a very exciting year for us celebrating the 20th year of our sustained human presence in space. So if you're 18 years or younger, some of you 19, uh, there has never been a time when we didn't have humans living and working in space. So again, we're tremendously proud of that. Looking ahead to some of the activities, things we're going to hear, um, we'll start to hear about things like engine ch being, engines chilled being chilled and prepared to handle cryogenic fuels. That's obviously a big part of the process. You don't want to run cryogenic temperatures through atmospheric temperature engines and engine bells. That can cause some problems. We'll also be hearing about the closing out of fueling um, and then changing things to, towards internal power as they check out all their systems for, for final liftoff here. Just to recap a little bit, some uh, some highlights we heard during our pre-launch briefing a couple of days ago. Uh, there's about 38 investigations that are going to be going up on this mission, um, 23 new ones and continuing the, the rest of them. And then we'll actually be returning home about 48 research projects. So it's never just about what's going up. It's also about what's coming down because that benefit of getting to evaluate things here on, gr on the ground after they've been in space is uh, is a huge benefit. Over the course of our uh, 20 years in space with sustained human presence, we've had about 2,900 investigations from 100 different country countries. So when we say it's an international space station, uh, we're very serious about that.
and very proud Beautiful of it as well. For strong back retract. So strong back retract. So now we're getting into some really exciting things. Visually, in just a few seconds, you're going to see the clamp just beneath the trunk of the dragon. It will, the clamp will open, and then the transporter erector or the strong back, um, the tower that's next to the to the falcon, will actually tilt back. So if you look just beneath um, where that dragon logo is, in just a few seconds, you should see that clamp begin to expand, and that tower will will tip back slightly, just a few degrees for now, and then it will tip back later at at liftoff. There you see the clamp opening. And it won't move very far, but you should see that tower next to the rocket tilt back just a few degrees. That tower primarily is responsible for delivering um, power telemetry and fuel to the vehicle during this process there. That's a great shot of watching that tower tip back. So after we do have liftoff this morning, you'll hear range, avionics, and propulsion um, engineers all making their own calls as we as we kind of track with this rocket uphill. The first stage's job is really to primarily get us out of the atmosphere, and the second stage is to deliver the Dragon to orbit. Stage one last load closed out. There's a liquid oxygen closeout call. Stage two loss is closed out. So we heard that first stage locks call just a minute ago, and that was the second stage locks close out call as well. We should be hearing from the range as well, declaring we're good to go. They're in charge of public safety. Again, the physical area as well as the path of the rocket. So looking for potential for collisions upon launch. Um, we're cleared those today. No concerns there. So everything is looking like we are go for launch. Gas closeouts are starting. We should get our final go for launch here from the launch director. Just Falcon 9 is in startup. Dragon is in startup. Go for launch. There we have the call for go for launch. You also may see water beginning to flood the launch pad at about 18 seconds to go. It's very normal. That's part of the sound suppression system, all part of the, yeah, the engineering seconds. of launch. That's 15 seconds. 10. Nine, Nine eight, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Engines ignition, liftoff.
of the Falcon 9 and Cargo Dragon, transporting critical research to enable living and working in Earth orbit and in deep space. Vehicle is supersonic. Vehicle has reached maximum aerodynamic pressure. A couple big calls there. Again, all normal, all nominal, and progressing as expected, flying through the densest part of the atmosphere. Recovery AOS. Call for chilling this the second stage engine. Stage one, boost back burn is starting. So very significant calls there. Uh, successful separation of the first stage from the second stage. That second stage there you see on screen uh, with the red hot engine that is now active and taking Dragon towards its or correct orbit. And we saw the, the boost back burn begin and hear that call as well. So the Falcon is headed towards the drone ship there again off the coast of Jacksonville. Stage one, boost back burn is shut down. Right now you're seeing the camera kind of flipping and essentially you're seeing uh, two camera views, one off, oh, you actually just see the nose cone flew past there. Um, that's a nominal jettison of the nose cone. There, that's a, it's a shot from the first stage. There's the hypersonic grid fins expanding to help control, uh, to help steer essentially uh, this rocket towards the drone ship. Acquisition of signal Bermuda. So again, on that on that second stage engine, you're seeing two camera views, one on either side of that engine. It's a great side by side. Again, the primary objective today is to get Cargo Dragon to its correct orbit, and the secondary objective is to recover that Falcon booster landing on. Of course, I still love you. About 185 nautical miles off the coast of Jacksonville. The camera on the left, I believe, is actually inside the top of the first stage, so you're getting kind of a view, uh, a look at the top of that. Stage two continues on nominal trajectory. Again, we use that term nominal. That essentially just means that we're within 
the expected and appropriate range where we should be. So that all that means is that everything is going according to plan. All right, so a lot of work done, a lot more to go. We are still not there yet. We have to kind of progress through the spacecraft deploy, solar array deploy, and check out to make sure everything is in good order. But that is going to do it for us, uh, for myself, from here in Hangar AE at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station uh, Mission Director Center. So it's been a pleasure being with you today. Uh, thanks so much. And I'm going to send it over to Andy in SpaceX's headquarters in Hawthorne, Calif Cal excuse me, Hawthorne, California. Andy? Thanks, Joshua. In order to land our drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean, the first stage needs to execute a series of three burns. The first is a boost back burn, which is meant to slow the rocket down and reorient it, reorient it for re-entry. That just completed a few seconds ago. Next is the entry burn, where Falcon 9 slows itself down before, before hitting the dense parts of the atmosphere. Without this second burn, relying solely on the atmosphere to slow down Falcon 9 would put unnecessary strain on the rocket. We should, hopefully we can see some footage of that coming up shortly. The third and final burn is the landing burn, and there's the, the shot of the entry burn. Uh, the third and final burn is the landing burn, which happens just before touchdown. It provides the booster a soft descent to attempt landing, and this is also when the four landing legs were deployed. Probably, we're probably about a minute away from beginning that landing burn. Uh, let's keep an eye on screen to see if we can see those engines relight. For this this final burn, Falcon 9 uses just a single Merlin engine, the center engine, engine number 9. On the left-hand screen, you see a shot of the second stage continuing its journey into orbit. And on the right-hand side, it's a view from the top of the first stage. Those Griffins are helping to guide the first stage back to a targeted landing. Stage one landing burn has started. And we did get confirmation that the landing burn did just start. That's a view from our drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. As we get closer, watch for those landing legs to deploy. Acquisition of signal in New Hampshire. Stage one landing legs have deployed. Looks like we may have lost the link of the footage. We're listening in to see if Stage one has landed. Recovery one is Recovery one is here. And touchdown of Falcon 9 on our drone ship. Of course I still love you. You can certainly hear the excitement uh, here at SpaceX. Congratulations to the entire SpaceX team for another successful landing. For those keeping track, this is first stage recovery number 46. Um, back to our primary mission. The second stage is still continuing its journey into its desired orbit. We should be hearing call-outs for second engine cutoff very shortly here. And good second engine cut cutoff. Now we're waiting for call-outs of a good orbit. It sounds like we do indeed have a good orbit. Up next is deployment Dragon of Dragon separate. from that second stage. When Dragon separates from the second stage, we can get a glimpse inside of Dragon's trunk. Dragon carries two types of cargo, pressurized cargo inside of the capsule and unpressurized cargo in its trunk. On the outside of Dragon's trunk are two protective fairings for Dragon solar arrays. The arrays produce more than five kilowatts of power and help recharge Dragon on its mission. At this point, we are about 20 seconds, 10 or 20 seconds away from Dragon separation. So let's listen in for the callouts. And there it is, successful deployment of the Dragon spacecraft. Uh, there is a view inside the unpressurized section of, cargo, of, of Dragon's trunk. 
With Dragon deployed, the next major milestone will be deployment of the solar arrays as Dragon makes its way to the International Space Station. Now let's pass it off to Dan for coverage of the solar array deploy. Hey, thank you very much, Andy. Great to see Dragon in orbit. Really cool, as always, to see that first stage touch back down on the drone ship. So as he mentioned, Dragon now flying free. You're actually getting a really cool view inside the trunk of Dragon where there's two external payloads. These are payloads that are already exposed to the vacuum of space. Uh, one of those, the larger one, is that high Sui. That's the hyperspectral imager from the Japanese government that's going to be installed. The other one's actually a spare battery. We've been doing a bunch of battery upgrades on the International Space Station, switching from older nickel hydrogen batteries to new lithium ion ones. And we are going to be standing by for a couple of minutes until we see those solar arrays deploy. You'll see them unfurl from the sides of the Dragon trunk. It'll eventually give Dragon a wingspan of about 50 feet, a little more than that. And this is actually one of the last few times you're going to see these solar array deploys on a Dragon spacecraft. Uh, as they are deploying, uh, there are some additional moving parts in them as compared to the new uh, Dragon design and the Crew Dragon, where those solar cells are actually wrapped around the trunk itself. Uh, that does cut down on a few moving parts, uh, some of the things that the engineers have to check out, all the screws, bolts, uh, and things like that, uh, and also the lock nuts, just making sure everything that's in place will actually be integrated into the trunk itself uh, for those future uh, Dragon missions. And they're going to be switching over to that Dragon type uh, once they start their CRS-2 contract deliveries, which is slated for uh, CRS-21, so just two missions from now. But again, still standing by for solar array deploy. We've been hearing some updates from the visiting vehicle officer here in Mission Control. Everything so far has looked great with this Dragon so far. Everything nominal, as uh, Josh was explaining, just meaning normal, by the book, on plan, uh, with the trajectory and everything so far. This is actually a view of those solar arrays. We'll start to see those unfurl momentarily. Solar and we did get some audio confirmation that the solar array deploy has begun. Dragon's propulsion system is success successfully primed and all thrusters are ready for firing. And there we go now getting a view of one set of the solar panels deploying. Again, one on each side of Dragon's trunk, giving a wingspan of about 54 feet once fully deployed, providing all of the electrical power to Dragon Systems as it makes its chase down of the International Space Station. And everything looking smooth, we'll wait for some audio confirmation that the solar arrays have deployed successfully. We are seeing on video both sets of solar arrays deployed. We're again just going to stand by for some. And we just now heard it. The solar arrays have been deployed successfully. The propulsion system on Dragon being primed for some uh, initial firings. Again, Dragon's going to be gradually raising its orbit over the next two days, two and a half days, until it arrives at the International Space Station. Dragon Solar Arrays have been successfully deployed and are ready for activation.
All right, so again, Dragon in orbit. Great to see another spacecraft on its way to the International Space Station. As always, back here in Mission Control Houston, I'm now joined by Kenny Todd. He's the Space Station Operations Integration Manager. Kenny, it was a great launch today. How, how's the team feeling with what they saw so far? Well, it's, uh, it's always great when we can get a new vehicle on the way to the Space Station, so we're very excited. I'm looking forward to uh, getting, getting the Dragon on board here in a couple of days. And so what's it going to look like for the crew? Now the Dragon's on its way. What's the schedule kind of looking like for the crew with coming days, coming weeks now for them? Sure. This really, this really does kind of lay our path forward here through, through the end of December on into the first, uh, first week of, of January now. Uh, an incredible amount of science coming up on board, over 5,000 pounds of new hardware coming on board. And so, so the crew uh, over the next couple of days will be getting ready. They'll finish out their training for, uh, for the um, – for being able to do the capture and and the grapple and getting getting the dragon birth and then after that we'll we'll be opening the hatch shortly thereafter uh, we've got some some science that we need to get across the hatch and and get up and up and running uh, so that's uh, that's gonna be the first couple of days here when we get going and right now it's scheduled to get there on Sunday correct correct well uh, uh, we have a typical time usually around five or so in the morning about the time we we do the, the capture operation that's a standard standard time for a dragon capture. Uh, usually by mid-morning, we'll have it uh, berthed, and depending on how things have gone during the during the day for the crew, we'll either get the hatch open or we'll wait till the till the following day and start with a clean, fresh day and and get in and and get going on the science. All right, thank you, Kenny. Obviously, this team going to be very involved with the SpaceX flight controllers out in Hawthorne over the next couple of days as Dragon makes its way there, and we're going to continue all this live coverage once Dragon does arrive. So be sure to wake up really early on Sunday morning and join us as we get ready to bring one more vehicle to the International Space Station. With that, though, that'll do it for us here from Houston. Send it back down to KSC, maybe get you some more launch replays. Back over to you, Jennifer. Thanks, Dan. Joining us now is SpaceX's Andy Tran. Andy, can you tell us a little bit about how launch went today? Yeah, sure thing. Thanks, Jennifer. We had a beautiful launch off Space Launch Complex 40 today. This was our 20th mission to the space station and our eighth launch with a flight-proven Dragon. I can confirm now that Dragon is in good orbit. The solar arrays have deployed on time, and then the guidance navigation control bay door should be opening later today. Dragon is on its way to the International Space Station and on track for capture on December 8th at approximately 3 a.m. Pacific Time or 11 a.m. Coordinated Universal Time. After berthing, the astronauts aboard the International Space Station will unload about 5,700 pounds of crew supplies and payloads. Dragon will then return to Earth after about a month at the orbiting laboratory. All around, it's been a successful mission so far. I want to take this time to thank our friends at NASA, the Air Force, the Federal Aviation Administration, and all of our customers for their support and hard work to ensure today's launch was a success. Back to you, Jennifer. Thanks, Andy. And that's going to wrap up our coverage. For more information, visit nasa.gov slash station or nasa.gov slash SpaceX. I'm Jennifer Wolfinger, and from everyone here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, thank you for joining us for the successful launch and landing of SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket. We leave you now with another look at today's launch. Have a great day, everyone. Ten, nine, nine, eight, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Engines ignition, liftoff of the Falcon 9 and Cargo Dragon, transporting critical research to enable living and working in Earth orbit and in deep space. Vehicle supersonic.